Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to be brief. I, um, as many of you know, I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCord School. I'm, uh, I'm an alum myself. In the 20 years between my graduation and my return, I was a Democratic campaign hack. And during those 20 years, I've, I had a very privileged and blessed career. I, I worked for presidents, for presidential candidates, for senators, for governors, every region of the country. There is no one I have encountered in my career who intimidates me more than the people that are about to be up here on this stage. Um, I've known them all at various levels, crossed paths with some of them a couple of times, worked very closely with others. Uh, one thing I, I learned very early in my career was that if Donna Brazil or Mignon Moore tell me to do something, I say, yes, ma'am, and I do it. Um, and so I could not be more thrilled to have them have them here uh, tonight for, it's gonna be a really fascinating conversation based on their experiences about life in, in this crazy world of politics. And we're also thrilled to have it moderated by one of our newest uh, fellows at the Institute of Politics and Public Service. So rather than give away any more, I'm gonna introduce the person who will introduce them, Shakira Vaughn, who is a senior in the college from Richmond, Virginia. I cut my teeth in Virginia politics and uh, we were just visiting about, about that, about Virginia politics. She's a, as I said, a senior in the college. She's president of GU Women of Color. She's a recipient of the Jose diaz Ballard Internship Fund uh, that we offered this past summer where she worked for her hometown mayor in Richmond. Um, to the extent that our panelists tonight are badass women of politics, uh, ladies, you are about to meet the next generation of badass women in politics. So Shakira, come on up. Yeah, I'll go behind, yeah. Yes. I know. <laughs> I guess maybe I'll come this way. <laughs> right, right. Just like last time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Shakira Vaughn, and I'm a senior in the college, as you guys are aware. Um, studying government and sociology, and I'm also the president of GU Women of Color. Uh, it gives me such great honor and pleasure to introduce this amazing panel. Uh, I would also first like to thank the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy for putting together this amazing event. <laughs> Our moderator this evening is going to be Mr. Jonathan Capehart who is no stranger to politics as he currently hosts the Cape Up podcast. Mr. Capehart is not only a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, but he is also a GU Politics Spring 2019 Fellow. It is a pleasure to have, us with, to have him with us tonight. <laughs> Our evening panelists are some of the most powerful black women in politics and are very good friends as they co-authored for Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics. Yolanda Carraway was introduced to politics at an early age when she volunteered for Bobby Kennedy's Senate campaign. She continued to shape the goals of the Democratic Party when she served as the former director of the DNC's Fairness Commission and chief of staff for Jesse Jackson for president in 1988. A proud Brooklyn native, Leah Daughtry <laughs> is the former CEO of the 2008-2016 Democratic National Convention Committees, making her the first person in Democratic Party history to hold this position twice. Ms. Daughtry continues to be a political and faith leader to this day. Named as one of DC's most powerful women, Mignon Moore was the political director of the Bill Clinton White House and CEO of the DNC. She held other high-level positions on the presidential campaigns of Reverend Jesse Jackson, Governor Michael Dukakis, and an infamous former Secretary of State who made history for women everywhere. Last, but certainly not least, we are joined by Ms. Donna Brazil, <laughs> the former chair of the Democratic Party, the first African-American woman to serve as the manager of a major party presidential campaign, running the campaign behind Al Gore for president in 2000, 
and she is a part of the reason why we received this past Monday off as she played a role in making MLK Day a federal holiday. She is also a very popular professor at Georgetown, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in her class, but <laughs> she is also a self-proclaimed diva. <laughs> <laughs> It, <laughs> it brings me great honor and joy to introduce the woman who reinforced the idea to this color girl who's considering politics that if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, introduction. Um, and thank you for, for taking uh, a responsibility away from me, and that is introducing all of you. <laughs> and I can jump right on in and start with how the begin the conversation where the book starts now i'm going to read something um from the book because it starts on july 26th 2016. Mm -hmm. president bill clinton was addressing the democratic national convention he was talking about his wife before she was to accept the democratic presidential nomination and you collectively write we sat facing him on the convention dais who are we we're the colored girls four African-American women who had been a part of his political life since he first entered politics on a national level. It was an unprecedented moment because we have, throughout our lives, been somewhat hidden figures in American politics. And so I want to start the conversation by asking, why do you proactively and insistently call yourselves the colored girls? <laughs> Well, since you have to leave, why don't you go ahead? We do the honors. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Ms. Brazil is going to have to leave yeah. at 7.40. So yeah. she, yeah. if she gets up and leaves, I, it's I've not been on campus since uh, 12 today, so I'm, I'm leaving early. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, first of all, welcome to Georgetown, Jonathan. Thank you. I've been here. This is my uh, 17th year at Georgetown. Uh, you're going to fall in love with the school and the students and... Uh, I can only tell you, and Mo, Mo knows this as well, this is a great institution, um, so welcome. Um, there was a, a moment in the 1988 campaign, and I know some of y'all you know, were born in the year 2000, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there was a moment in the 1988 campaign when Mignon and I, I started in the 84 Jackson campaign, Jesse Jackson, Mignon was in the 19, uh, and along with Yolanda and Leah, and Mignon was involved in that Jackson 88. At the end of the campaign, we went over to the quote unquote, the nominee, that was Michael Dukakis. And one afternoon, there was a decision to move the leaders of the campaign to another floor, thereby leaving the rest of the campaign staff on the lower floor. We decided it was important that the campaign reflect the diversity of our country, and we wanted to be part of that leadership, and we were part of that leadership by virtue of our status in the campaign. So we went up to the ninth floor where the leadership had gathered, and we decided to take over a conference room. Uh, it was the chairman's office, and we turned it into a staff office where everyone could come and have a seat at the table. And when we closed the door that evening, we said, for color girls, we shall not be moved. Mm -hmm. And so this was a moment when we understood that we had a role. We also, uh, uh, I think we titled the Harriet Tubman Sojourner Truth Ought to Be Well Annex. Mm -mm. <laughs> so it was clear that it was a room for women, women of all colors mm -hmm. and women of all backgrounds. Susan Rice and many others joined with us. But the truth is, is that it became more than a room for colored women or black women, or Latinas, or Asian American women. It became a room for everybody on the campaign. And we were proud to be, I guess, uh, we were proud that we led that initiative and it was a, a safe place for us to be in the campaign to not only share our truth, but also to have a space for people in the campaign to come and be part of the leadership. I just, want, I just want to make one uh, historical fact that Donna just kind of glided over and she kind of put us there at the same time. That wasn't true. She was already there because Gephardt had lost 
way before Jackson had. <laughs> so, you know, we were the rebel campaign, but Gephardt had lost. So I just want True. you young people to know that Jackson's campaign was still sustaining. So by the time I did get there, Donna was on, she's on strike, but that's a whole nother story. We'll get to <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's another story. Yeah, it's in, it's <laughs> it's in, in the book. book. <laughs> it is in the book. Yeah. So actually bringing up Gephardt and talking about Jackson actually is one of the high points. Mm -hmm. By the time you're talking about Jackson, you all had start had been working in in the the field of politics for a little while. Yeah. How about you each go through and talk about that that spark mm -hmm. for you when you decided politics is where I where I want to spend my time and spend my life. Let's start with you, Leah. Um, I, I am a, a, a daughter of the church. I'm a fifth generation pastor. And so our church has always been a social justice, community-based activist church. So we were always doing something in politics, whether it was registering people to vote or rallies or uh, 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 helping candidates. So I'd done it all my life, but it wasn't until I got to college, I went to Dartmouth and uh, during uh, Reverend Jackson's campaign and he called, uh, I'd known him all of my life and he called and he said, I need you to help us organize a campaign in New Hampshire, and you don't tell Reverend no. Mm. So I said, sure. I had no idea what that meant, because <laughs> I'd never worked on a presidential campaign. I, not, not even the first clue. Like most of us who worked on the campaign, we'd never done it before. We just, we knew him, we shared his values, and we were interested in, in, helping, in helping out. So I started working on the campaign uh, while I was in college in New Hampshire for the 84 cycle. Um, and, and that was a that was a new experience for me working on politics at that level, that presidential uh, level. And, and there were just things that, you know, you don't read about in the paper, you don't know about. And he took us into spaces, into rooms that we didn't even know existed, that we didn't understand the process. You know, we just knew you go and you vote. That was the first time I ever voted for in the presidency that I was old enough to vote. I voted for Reverend Jackson. And so that was the spark for mm -hmm. me. And I just stayed involved at that level. I moved to Washington from Brooklyn and I've been in Washington on and off <laughs> ever since. I don't love Washington, I love Brooklyn. So <laughs> when I get tired of Washington, as they know, I just pack up and move back home. Yes, and I do. work in Brooklyn and then I just decide, oh, okay, this is something interesting in Washington and I'll come back to Washington. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's how I kind of got started. Now, Yolanda, you talk about in the book how politics wasn't even on your radar screen. You wanted to be a doctor. Uh, yeah. At one point. At one point. And what, what, <laughs> what happened, happened? What, what happened, happened that made you realize that being a doctor was not for you? And then talk about what got you into politics. So this was a, um, this was a summer. Uh, I had flunked algebra for the oh. second time, oh. and I had to go to summer school. Oh, that's new. Wait. That's not in the book. That's not in the book. I thought it was uh, no, the book. Not. Well, that's what happened. That's what had happened. <laughs> and I had to go to summer school. And so I had a girlfriend uh, who wanted to be a nurse, and she actually became a nurse. But we decided we were going to volunteer to uh, at St. Mary's Hospital, the hospital where I was born, and volunteer to be candy stripers. Now, do you all know what candy stripers are? I don't know if they still have candy stripers. I don't know if they have the candy, candy stripers were, were young women that volunteered, teenagers that volunteered volunteers. in hospitals. Yeah, volunteers. You know, we <laughs> emptied bedpans, we ran errands, we did, you know, all kinds of stuff that you do, do in a hospital. And we had these uniforms that looked like candy, candy canes. They had candy cane stripes, so that's why they called them the candy stripers. They were red and white? Yeah. They looked like blood, you know. <laughs> 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 That's, why That's called foreshadowing. And so then. Yeah. So I would go, so I'd go to, go to my algebra class and I'd leave and I'd go to St. Mary's Hospital to, to um, do my candy striper duties. And, and, and one day um, somebody came in, they sent me to the emergency room. And somebody came in all bloody. I can't remember if he'd been shot or stabbed or what happened. And I took one look and that was it. I said, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> this is not gonna work for me. <laughs> So, 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 then, so then what was the, the, um, that moment when you got pulled into politics and knew that that was what well, was that, for you? That moment was around the same time, mm -hmm. around the same age. I was 14. And, and this was actually during school that year. And a friend of mine 
came up and asked me, he said, why don't you go with me to volunteer to work on Bobby Kennedy's campaign? He was running for the Senate in New York State. Uh, and President Kennedy had been assassinated the year before, so, you know, we were all, in, everybody was all in love with the Kennedys. So I said, okay, you know, I was always looking for something to do so I didn't have to go home after school. <laughs> so every day I take the bus, from, it's a long way too, I took the bus from the east side of town to the west side of town and uh, went to the office. And this was my first experience like this. Licked envelopes, made phone calls, uh, you know, did all kinds of things. Mimeograph machines, which you don't know what that is. That's one of those things where you crank up and, and they make copies of stuff. <laughs> you have to put the blue ink in. Yeah, yeah. You have to make put the, the paper in. And go and I love the looks on their faces. They're like, what? You might as well be talking about dinosaurs. At this and you got ink all over your face. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. so nasty. And it smelled, it, it, smelled, but it was, awful. smelled awful, but everyone smelled smelled You had to paper. crank it up before you could roll yeah. off the first copies. Oh, God. I'm so old. I'm so old. So by the time of the end of the campaign, they sent me outside, sent me out to canvas from door to door, and I actually, my 14-year-old self knew, sounded like I knew what I was talking about. But I understood the issues, and I understood what he was trying to do. And my, my, always, my thing was I always wanted to help people, so that was the doctor thing. Then I wanted to be a social worker. But then I learned doing this. This is another way you help people. Mm -hmm. And it, wasn't, it was a way that I never thought about before. Mm -hmm. um, so that was when I kind of got bitten by the bug. And then mm -hmm. when I moved to Baltimore, I was, my brother-in-law was a uh, elected, he was a state representative, and I ran his office. So that was my first professional job. Mm -hmm. But everything I did up to that point was vo just volunteered on campaigns all the time. I just loved the work. Mm -hmm. And I found out something about myself that I didn't know that I was a good organizer. I could raise money. I could ask people for money. I, you know, I could do all the things you need to do to run a campaign, and I was good at it. And I enjoyed it. It was fun. So it became, it became my passion, my job and my passion. Mm -hmm. Mignon, is it safe to say that you came to politics later than 14? Yes, very safe. Um, so, what, <laughs> <laughs> so, so then what was that moment for you? Um, I don't know if it was a cross between um, going to this big meeting that they had organized for Harold Washington. See, I was actually from corporate America, as you can tell. You know, well. <laughs> and so I worked for Encyclopedia Britannica. It is not Wikipedia. It's not Google. It is the books. So, we, you know, we are not old, but that's the era I came from. And so I started volunteering at this organization called Operation Push. It was Reverend Jackson's first uh, organization when he, when he left Dr. King. And at the time, we were trying to elect our first African-American mayor. But there was this woman that was really in charge, even of Reverend Jackson. And so she would take me to these meetings with her when they first started organizing for Harold Washington. And I mean, I, when I tell you, they were powerful meetings. Every leader, black, white, blue, brown, was in these meetings. I had no role but to sit over in the corner. I had her purse, and I was just sitting there, and I was absorbing this information, and I was trying to figure out, well, wow, because the first thing he said to them, which struck me as, like, you know, you got all these high-level high leaders here, and so he said that you all are not going to put me out here if you're not going to help me build a coalition, if you're not going to help me raise money, and if you're not going to help me register voters. So he decided that that day he wasn't doing it. So they came back. I was still in the corner holding the purse, <laughs> and that's when he decided to run. And I was trying to figure out, so all of these people, you know, were like us, our age, but there were no people that looked like you. So I went back to push and I started gathering up my friends and I said, you know, we should go down to Harold Washington's office and we should help get them elected, get him elected. And they were looking at me like, well, okay. So we took the <laughs> L downtown. So then we asked the lady, okay, where's the youth, where's the youth office? And she pointed to another corner, <laughs> a corner with a table. She said, that's the youth office and you are the organizers. But what I learned from that because we really did work very hard from him, what I learned from that was to leverage our own power because young people actually made the difference in his election. So when I started going down to his office without an appointment saying, oh, I need you to come to my church, I thought I had the right to do it because I had worked so hard for him. And eventually I did get that to happen, but that was my first clue into if you put yourself in these campaigns, don't leave 
once you have elected that person. Stay involved and, you know, if you're in there for a community, come back and ask for something. And I did. Now, uh, Donna, you have been basically in politics your entire life. Younger than 14, when did you push, was it a playground? Age of nine. Nine, yes. Yep. Nine years old. What happened? Um, it was uh, the night of Dr. King's assassination that really um, inspired and motivated me. In the middle of, I guess, mourning and crying about the death of someone that was so uh, instrumental and in helping to reshape the, the segregated South that I grew up in. The following year after King's assassination, there were many people deciding to run for office and one of the candidates promised to build a playground. They also promised to you know, put schools in the African-American community to you know, roads and, and I'm like, nobody has a car, okay? So who cares about the roads? We need a playground. <laughs> the kids on the other side of the track, the white kids had a playground. We didn't have a playground. And you all know what happens when you grow up and you're in the South and it's hot outside. You want to go out and play. And so this candidate promised to build a playground and I went door to door. I had a big mouth back then. <laughs> and <laughs> knocked on doors and I said, Ms. Hermione, you registered to vote. Ms. Jack, Ms. Lois Jean. I went door by door from... Fillmore Street to Taylor Street to Jackson Street, Webster Street, where Wynton uh, Wint Marsalis grew up. I tell people Wynton, like me, was, he was born in New Orleans, but he grew up on Webster Street. And I found out all of the people in the area who needed to register to vote, over 300 people. We got them registered. That year, we held an election, and the, he won, and the playground was built. I've been involved in politics ever since. So, mm -hmm. I love politics. Well, well, clearly, I and, I, wanna, <laughs> and I, wanna, I want to, and I'm throwing this out there to all of you because I want you all to just talk all over each other about this. Mm -hmm. And you write it in the book, and it wasn't until I read your book that I fully appreciated the importance of Reverend Jackson's first and second mm -hmm. campaigns for president. Mm -hmm. Not just for the history-making um, effort being you know, the second African-American Mm -hmm. um, to make a push for it with a leg legitimate claim. But it was that campaign that put all of you on the map. And I remember from a previous conversation when we've all sat down and talked, um, it was there that you, you all learned basically the jobs and the roles that you went on to do and, mm -hmm. and that you, you have now. Mm -hmm. Talk about the significance of Reverend Jackson's both campaigns. Well, I started in the Jackson 84 campaign, and although I had campaign experience at the state and local level, I had no national level. I, in the 1976 Carter campaign, I was the youth director. I was 16, so if you want to do the math, <laughs> I'm 29 for the second time. I'm still a millennial. Um, <laughs> but I had experience at the state and local level in Louisiana, and Reverend Jackson actually not only made a, 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 put a seat there for all of us, but he gave us roles and responsibilities that we never, people of color, African Americans, and I have to add, because of the Rainbow Coalition, women, I mean, Reverend Jackson gave us seats at the table. Uh, it was, we registered millions of Americans to vote because of the outreach that Reverend Jackson uh, did, and I'll let Leah and uh, Yolanda and, and Mignon talk about it. We changed the rules of the party. He made the, the road possible for Barack Obama and many other candidates to win, not just federal offices, but also state and local offices. For me, I think part, part of uh, what he did was he helped us to change the definition of winning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we went into these campaigns where the goal was you win the White House, you win the presidency, you've won everything. Uh, and that clearly didn't happen, but our vision was shifted so that winning took on a different meaning. We registered, as Donna said, millions of people to vote, and by the end of his two campaigns, every city, every major city in America had a black mayor. Mm -hmm. That's right. On the strength of the people who were new, newly registered to vote through the Jackson campaign. The Democratic Party was forced to change its rules. That was part of the negotiation with Jack, Reverend Jackson, and some of those rules still exist today. Mm -hmm. He is the reason that the Democratic Party does not have winner-take-all primaries. Right. Prior to Reverend Jackson, that's what we had. You win 51% of the vote, you get all the delegates mm -hmm. because we did winner take all 
part of what he did is said that's not fair, and he moved the party and we demanded that the party move to proportional representation, which allowed new candidates to come into the process and to have a, a better chance at winning. He changed the delegate process. Mm -hmm. So when you think about winning, the long range effect of the Jackson campaigns, in addition to those two things I mentioned, the numbers of people that trained and had a chance and mm -hmm. who are everywhere now across the American political <clears throat> spectrum, whether that they are working in politics, retail politics, meaning registering people to vote and working on campaigns, or whether they're in policy, or whether they're on the finance side of the ledger, mm -hmm. all got their feet wet in the Jackson campaign, and so became, so now you've got folks shaping and changing the narratives and really uh, uh, helping campaigns to be what they are, because that's what we trained with him. And so if, did he win? Yes, he won in a way that he changed the American political narrative mm -hmm. in a way that I think uh, has longer, a longer lasting impact than if we had won the White House. Mm -hmm. And we're still, three of us, we're still members of the Democratic National Committee and we're on the mm -hmm. Rules Committee, which helped shape the delegate selection process for the presidential race that's coming up in 2020. I've been on the rules committee now. I, I don't want to tell you because then y'all will go out there and say, we don't like super delegates. We don't want, do not take my seat. I'll fight you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. And Reverend Jackson would always tell us, you got to know the rules mm -hmm. in order, order to know how to break the rules creatively mm -hmm. and so with lots of new candidates come on the scene and they want to do this it's like y'all better go learn the rules the reason you can't win and you don't understand this delegate process is because you haven't done the work to understand the rules you better know how this thing works we play bid whiz and uno there's a raging thing on on facebook now about the uno rules have y'all seen this it's this week about the do y'all know what uno is okay <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't know what the mimeograph was, so that wasn't uh, an unfair know, question. Uh, so there's this thing about what is the what is the for the four card mean, and people want to change the rules about what the what to take four card means. It's like, no, these rules have been in existence for the last thousand years. You don't change the rules now. <laughs> you can't come in and now you want to change the rules because you decided to play. But it's the same thing with presidential politics. You can't win this nomination if you don't understand the rules. And the rules are foundational to everything. And he taught us know the rules, daughters. Yep. You better go in there and find out what the rules are so we can figure out how we're going to maneuver around these rules. A that good example is that when Hillary would, would uh, win a, uh, Bernie would win a state and Hillary would win the delegates, and that is because we made those delegate rules proportional to the Democratic vote. So yeah. if you win, say, a rural part of the state, we might award you three delegates, but in that uh, Democratic uh, compacted oh, district yeah. stronghold, we give you five delegates. Mm -hmm. And so we made sure that not only did we have re representation, but we also ensured that everyone can compete in a fair way and get delegates, but especially those where we know we have a concentration of Democratic Party votes. Yolanda, you were That's because of Jesse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, you know, it was, it was <laughs> I always say Reverend Jackson raised us. Yep. 1984 was the first campaign. And Donna will say that they did not know what they were mm, doing sure at, all. Oh, right. at all. At <laughs> all. Driving a plane without a pilot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they learned. Yeah. And then when he wanted to run again in 88, he was so much careful to bring in experienced people who right. knew the rules and who right. knew that these was things. That's why I was in 88. <laughs> <laughs> I was in 88, too. I was the rules person. Yes. yes. That's because we had built the plane in 84. Uh-huh. Yes. So they had some. And it, it landed over there somewhere over in we the field. The well, I, I came over to work we from home. We cut the grass before they got on the field. Uh-huh. I, mm. I came over to work from him from the, from the mm -hmm. DNC, where I ran the rules commission. Uh -huh. So I knew the rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was just such, it was such a different process. And as we went along, we, we, we started all of a sudden raising money, yeah. <laughs> really raising Me? a lot of money and winning. Yep. Yeah, we, were, we, we won Super Tuesday, mm -hmm. yep. and then we won Michigan, the caucuses in Michigan, and that was like, okay, now we got to take this seriously. Because <laughs> no, at that point, like, he wait, was you were taking it seriously we before. <laughs> we were taking it seriously, but not that seriously. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's like, oh my goodness, we might oh win. God. Yeah, right, yep. we might yeah. win this thing. <laughs> but so was it, you, you still express sort of amazement 
how many years later, 30 something years later yeah. that he won Michigan. Were you guys just blown, blown away by the fact that he won a state like yes. Michigan? I was actually in Michigan and I was blown away. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't really, you know what, and this is, I think this is what is critical about the Jackson campaign and the rules. We really didn't know the impact that these states had on a presidential candidate. Now, Joel knew he was the state director. Yeah. So we, 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 we're all in our little, you know, we don't have, I don't even know if the victory party was, the room was this big, but we're all in there. <laughs> we're watching these returns come back. And then we're like, hmm, look like we might be winning this. <laughs> But we wasn't, you know, for those of us that were like, you know, field people, we didn't really, really understand what was happening. But what it did was it put him ahead in the delegate count. Mm -hmm. Right. So when the paper read the very next morning, Jackson wins Michigan caucus, he's ahead in delegates. Oh, my God, the white people, their hair was on oh. fire. <laughs> because they said, oh, my God, this man is going to win this win. thing. Oh and they God. really got serious. They got, I'm, and they started taking him serious. And the question turned from, you know, dismissing him to what does Jesse, Jesse want? want. On yeah. every single yeah. magazine. What does Jesse Time, want? Time, Newsweek, all yeah. the big what magazines. Does what want? does Jesse want? The and and then 20 Jesse years want? later, President Obama, Barack Obama wins Iowa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So think about that trajectory. trajectory. For those of you listening to the mimeograph to, of course, now that you got all your smartphones there. <laughs> well, Reverend Jackson is a giant. I want to run through. How much time do we have? Really? Just five minutes before? Okay, we got to. Wow. Okay, so there are a couple of giants that we have to talk about because they were foundational uh, to you. Um, there's, well, the original colored, colored girls, girls, as mm -hmm. you call them. Dr. Betty Shabazz, yes. um, Coretta Scott King, Bless Maya us. Angelou, part of. Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. Maya Angelou. Uh, if each Dorothy of you would take Hyde. one, say it again. Dorothy Height. Yes, Dorothy Height was. Uh, talk, each one of you take one of them and talk about. Um, actually, I'm going to start with with you, Leah, and have you talk about Dr. Height. I was going to talk about Dr. Betty, but okay. All right. But, well, start with Dr. Height because you would run into her. Yes. Uh, in the mornings. Uh, Dr. Height and my dad were friends. Uh, he was the chair of the National Black United Front. And she, they had done a lot of struggle things together. Um, so when I came to Washington after one of my Brooklyn breaks, I came back to Washington <laughs> uh, to work for Alexis Herman, who was the new Secretary of Labor and uh, Second Clinton. So I uh, actually lived in Dr. Height's apartment. She had an empty apartment in the building. And I lived there on the second floor. She was on the first floor. Alexis was on the sixth floor. So every morning I would see Dr. Height. And Dr. Height, I had a dog back then, a little chihuahua. And, um, you know, dogs have to be walked. So I was up, you know, walking the dog with just wearing whatever my hand touched, just whatever was the nearest thing. I would put it on and I'd go downstairs to, to walk my dog. And there would be doctor, I don't care what time of the morning it was, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., she was in the lobby waiting for her driver to take her to work. Now, she was a good 83 years old. And the building wasn't that far. She had uh, arranged to buy uh, the building at 633 Pennsylvania Avenue mm -hmm. for, as the headquarters for the National Council of Negro Women. <laughs> and this, if you ever have a chance, go down there because it's historic in that it is one, the place where Abraham Lincoln sat for his portrait, his mm -hmm. official portrait, mm -hmm. but it's also the site of the last slave market in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And now that building is the headquarters of NCNW and it's the only African-American building owned on Pennsylvania Avenue. Avenue. Yeah. So I go down the lobby and there she'd be hat, lipstick, dressed. Look her up on, find a picture of her right now so that Boo -boo. you can visualize. You have to get, I mean, she Leah was at the era where you wore a hat every day. Hat, lipstick. Dorothy Height. Uh, uh, like she was going to church and she was in the lobby 6.30 in the morning dressed and ready to go to do the people's business at, at NCW. And there I was slinking around with like, looking like I'd been all up, up all night studying for finals with a dog. And I tried to go out the back door and she said, Ms. Daughtry, and I go, damn it, <laughs> <laughs> she saw me. And I, yes, Dr. Height, and she never called you by your first name. None of them. Of, of that era, mm -hmm. the titles were important yes. for them as a sign of respect. So it was always Ms. Daughtry. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Height, and she said, and she'd go, mm. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give me the up down. Give me the up down. <laughs> and then tell me what it was she, she'd ask about my dad. And then she said, here's what I need done today. I did not work for Dr. Hyde. <laughs> I had a job. I was the chief of staff at the United States Department of Labor. I had a job. <laughs> did not matter. Dorothy Hyde gave you your instructions for the day. She said, and I will call you later. And mm -hmm. she would call later, or she'd call you first thing in the morning while you were still in the bed. Mm -hmm. And hello, Miss Daughtry, I need one, two, three, four, five, six things. Uh, and I'll call you later. Click, didn't say goodbye, mm -hmm. didn't say hello, click. Mm -hmm. And around about noon, because mm -hmm. she figured three hours was enough time <laughs> for you to get done all the stuff she wanted, she called to check in. And if you didn't have it done, she's like, I will give you a call in another hour, Miss Daughtry, click. click. <laughs> and it was, uh, some things were small things, like I need, you know, something catered. I don't, I need something catered. Or I need, I'm trying to reach Cortland Malloy. Or yep. I, or I get want President Clinton on the phone. Yeah, I need yeah. to find <laughs> President Clinton uh, today at, uh, and I'm, I'm available at 2.30. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay. <laughs> or I want to have a press conference at the building at three o'clock today. And could you, could you put that together for me? And you're like, I have a job. But you didn't say no because of her iconic status and what she meant to our community and to our people, and just a tremendous respect. And the fact that she was 90 years old going to work every day, still trying to advance the cause of African-American women. Yeah. You just did what she said, and you just kept it moving. And the next morning, she'd be back in the lobby uh, with her next with, set of instructions. Well, um, I know I listed all of these names, but there is another um, Dorothy, Dr. Dorothy Hyde story mm. um, where I think she called you, Donna. Uh, mm for President Obama's first inaugural. Yes. Yeah. Um, Leah has set up mm -hmm. her expectations. Oh, God. Now talk about this task you were, you were handling. I, I, I'll never forget, Do Dr. Height made me aware that I had more than one skill. Um, if she wanted a press release, she would call and say, I need you to draft a press release, and she would hang up the phone. Uh, but Barack Obama had just been elected President of the United States, and she wanted, not just a ticket to the inaugural, the swearing-in ceremony. She wanted to be on the podium <laughs> with President Obama, and she wanted her car parked on the tarmac at the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> and she called that morning. And I mean that day before, and told me. And Wait, I'm the like, day before yeah, the inauguration? Yeah, practically that weekend. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. That part's well, not in the book. I was at the DNC. Yeah. Yeah. I was at the DNC, and so she had been trying to work through the inaugural apparatus, and what they had done was given her a, tickets on the bus, yeah. on the VIP bus. Oh yeah, that was to a go hard to the Capitol. And she was a woman in a wheelchair, so that really wasn't <laughs> working for her. Was, so we were trying to figure out another way for her to get there, because the bus was not going to happen. And, and, wow. and, and by the way, at this point in my life, I was not a congressional staffer. I was, I mean, I'm like, why did she call me and hang up the phone? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it dawned on me that Nancy Pelosi was the Speaker of the House, right? So I got the parking resolved, and that Diane Feinstein was the chair of the inaugural committee for the Congress, and I got the seats. But can you imagine? That was Dorothy Hyde. Mm -hmm. And but she was an amazing woman. She lived in full expectation that whatever she was asking us to do, we had the ability to get it done. Yeah. And, there was an, and we wow. were like, how am I going to do? And you said, how am I going to do that? I don't know. Yeah. But, but, you, done, but right? you get it done. You figure out how to get doing it done. Mm -hmm. And that's the, one of the many lessons that when you read this book um, that comes through, the, ex the high expectations from people who just turned to you and depended on you just to get it done. Mm -hmm. And all of you, like, how the hell am I going to get this mm -hmm. done? But you got it, but you got it done. And those, we learned. That's yeah. how we learn. That's how we learn. Yep. And you never, you didn't want to fail them. They mm -hmm. were so important. Mm -hmm. I think back this past weekend with Mrs. King, and Mrs. King was such a, uh, an important part of the civil rights struggle. Women were such an important part. And when Mrs. King said to me, I was 22 when I started organizing the 20th anniversary of the historic 63 March on Washington, she believed in me. I was 22 years old. And some of the men did not believe it, a 22-year-old, but she had faith in us. And I think that's the thing about our mentors, whether it was Shirley Chisholm or Dorothy Hyde uh, or Willie Barrow, they had, they had faith in us. 
And that's what we're trying to, you know, pass on to your generation. We have faith in you. We're on the, we're on the heels of Dr. King's birthday. Just imagine this for one second. You get a call and it's from Coretta Scott King. Yep. And she says, like Leah says, Miss Moa. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. She says, this is Coretta. I said, yes, ma'am. She says, I need you to go down. I, I don't know what they thought we did at the White House. I swear to God, I don't. I need you to go and speak with the president because I would like him to reopen Martin's case. So that's like real, I mean, that's like real big deal. I mean, you know, you go to the president's office, you, you just gonna go to the president's office. I mean, there's a whole protocol, but she really, ex <laughs> and you know, you start churning in your head saying, you know, is it too risky for the president to open, reopen Martin Luther King's case? Do you fail her? Do you not do it? She got the meeting with the president and the president reopened the case. But is, this is a lesson in building coalitions inside the White House as well, because right. I had to make sure we had, I had allies before I went that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. stepping up in there. We had to all believe that that case need to be reopened. And it was, you know, it was one of the last great acts I think that President Clinton did for the King family, and I will be forever grateful that I had the courage to push it through. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yolanda, do you have a, a story of, of any of the women I mentioned before we I, turn I, it to I, questions? I no, you go, go ahead and go. Okay, we're gonna she's open iconic. It. She doesn't need <laughs> <a> comment. <laughs> we're we're going to open Jonathan, it up to I'm, questions. I'm, I'm um, going to skip out. And I know she's got to oh, go. That's Part of the King go. celebration, I have one more college campus tomorrow. Hey my class every Wednesday from 2 to 4.30. <laughs> and now that I know there's something around here that most, I'll see you there too at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks, Donna, I for, for being here. Uh, okay. So we're opening up, for, oh, it's a roving mic. Okay, okay. great. So keep, them, keep the questions questions and short, no statements or I'm, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Because <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> Believe in me. I love okay, it. so hi, my name is Nia Blast. I'm a freshman in the college. And essentially, my question focuses on this. I think that black women, in particular in politics, are in a volatile and precarious place. I think when we look at people like Donna Edwards or even like Mia Love on the Republican side, they can love you just as easily as they hate you. And they love your fieriness and your progressiveness and what you stand for in terms of diversity in one instant, in one second, when you're not falling into party lines. They dismiss you. Question. How do you contend with that? as a black woman hoping to get into politics and the position that you exist in within that political spectrum? That is an excellent question because that is the entire basis of this book. Yeah. Should we say read yeah. the book? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that really is, is a, a very, very good question and it's also an excellent question, but I do think you have to, and I think for us, we learned at a very early age, you have to figure out what your own internal compass is because there's some people, like we're all, all of us are very different. We are all very, very different. You know, Dinah can be fiery at times. I can be fiery at times. All of us can be fiery. Then those of us want to hold back. So I think the real challenge for black women at this particular juncture is you got to be true to who you are. Mm -hmm. And you got to be guided by whatever that moral compass you have on the inside. If you have the courage to stand up and speak your truth, then no matter what it sounds like, no matter what, you know, the little podcast girls asked me some question in the, uh, in the room, how did you face challenges? And I said, I developed this skill in all due respect. But they knew when I got ready to go, in all due respect, something else was coming behind it. But, you know, that's just how I level set. Some, some people just, you know, some people just feel like the fire and brimstone way is the way to go. That's not necessarily my style, but that is not my level of courage. Because I sit in no room. And that's where you have to, and this is just not a black issue. It's not a black mm -hmm. female issue. It is a female issue. Sit in no room mm -hmm. and know that something is being said that you know is indifferent to women or indifferent to your culture and you don't have the courage to speak up. That's troubling. And so you just have to just, you know, even if you do it like, hey, listen, let me just give you another picture on this. And you just gotta find, I, I, to me, and this is where Maya Angelou taught us, courage is the most important thing you can have. I don't care if you're fiery, not fiery, or indifferent. If you don't have courage, it's not gonna matter. 
Yeah. I, I'm so impressed with this new crop of young women too. that have come into the Congress yeah. and gotten elected other places. Yeah. But these, these young women, they, they didn't sit around and wait, wait for the for party. Mm -hmm. They didn't wait for anybody. They decided they were going to, spend, they were going to use their voice and they were going to go, go after what they wanted to go after. You can't, sometimes you just can't sit and wait. You have, just like Mignon said, you have to know your own compass. Yeah. You have to know your own self and what you want to do and just have the courage to do it. The, the only thing I'd add is that uh, politics isn't different from any other uh, mm -hmm. industry in in the world, and there are going to be people who like you and who don't, mm -hmm. who are going to support you and who are not. Mm -hmm. Politics isn't alone in that, mm -hmm. and that's just part of navigating life. Yeah, I mean, look in your family. There's people that like you and people that you have. <laughs> that, that, I mean, so and so is on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> You know, some people you look at the call ID and say, no, not today. But that's, but that's not, what I want you to, to walk away with is mm -hmm. the challenges you face in politics or in the workplace or in business or in education or whatever you do are the same. Yeah. They're going to be, you, everybody not going to like you. And don't Welcome worry about the these labels. And who cares? These labels are phony. Yeah, who, can, yeah, who cares if, 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 if people talking behind your back? If you are focused on what you're trying to do, then you'll be succeeding. And then to, to Mignon, something she said earlier, look, you're going into these difficult rooms and you don't know, know where your votes are. Yeah. No when you walk in the five. room and you get ready to propose something, don't go in cold that you're not going to win. No. Know who's with you, who's against you, and who doesn't care. <laughs> Don't go in like I used to have to go in and one of my colleagues, he would propose some of the most preposterous stuff. And then, of course, we we're supposed to align with that because, you know, we, don't want, we want to be in one voice and we'd be going, yeah, we agree. We didn't agree at all. And we'd come out that room and say, why didn't you give us a heads, heads up? up? And so that's the other, I think that's the other challenge. Don't, don't think you can, you're going to get your politics done or whatever you feel like you're doing and you're holding it to yourself. Figure out who else feels the same way. You know, to, more to your, mm -hmm. to your point, or actually mm -hmm. I should uh, add on yeah. to what they've all said is what they write, uh, well, it was on page 42 in, in my copy of the book. I don't know what page it is in the actual um, hard copy, um, but you write, we come from very different backgrounds and have very different styles of how to get the job done. Mm -hmm. The idea that black women are a monolith has mm -hmm. always made Washington a tough place to navigate for black women, some view as not fitting what their white colleagues considered to be the norm. Mm -hmm. And that is a mantra throughout this book. Mm -hmm. They make it clear, and as you have seen, each one of these women is completely different from the other. And they want to make that clear that just because you see a black woman, you do not know or understand black women just by the one black woman you, you might know. Any other questions? Oh, let's a question. Hello, uh, Hello. My name is Natalie, and I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service. And actually, I thought of this because of what you were saying. Um, I'm an Asian American woman, and I've always wondered if the term women of color somehow hom homogenizes the black experience mm -hmm. and whether me as an Asian American woman facing very different obstacles that does not compare at all to what black women in this country mm -hmm. have to face um, does a disservice to you? Um, you know, for me, I don't think so. so. Because, you know, things just evolve. You know, you go from, and you know, I would also encourage our white sisters that's in this room to not think of this book just as for black women or mm -hmm. women of color. This book is for people that want to go in a room, want to learn what their past, I want to learn their history. But in answer to your question, I, you know, some of those things just don't bother me because some, sometimes I feel like I am interchangeable. Well, sometimes, and plus there's strength in numbers. Yeah, sometimes I want to, to be a woman together. of color. You know, I want to embrace, you know, white women, Asian women, the LGBT community, all of that. I want all of that to be a part of me. And then there are just days where I'm just cold black. And I want you to know that I am just cold black and I ain't gonna make no apology about it. But then there's some days I just wanna be free and yeah. loving. And, and, I, and I, think, I think it goes, it goes for all the communities. Yeah. I would not presume to understand the Asian American experience in America. I don't, I don't 
there are things that I'm sure are unique to that experience, yeah. as it is to Latinas, as it is to Native women. And I think we should honor that yeah. and honor what your particular experience is mm -hmm. in this country. But there are, there are points where none of us are white folk living on white privilege, mm -hmm. right? So there is some commonality mm -hmm. in our experience and, it's, and, it, and it helps for us to band together. Mm -hmm. but, at this, at, but if there are some points where it's about Asian women and it's yeah. about native women yeah. and I as a black woman go, go sister and I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, uh, homogenize to use your word mm -hmm. or to gloss over the fact that we have this beauty in the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm fine with that and there are times for me to stand behind you as an Asian woman and say, yes, go girl, I'm right with you, what you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And there are times for us to be one big happy people, women mm -hmm. of color together, and then yeah. sometimes it's just, we just women. Right. And deal in a patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are, there are points of, of intersection and then there are points of, uh, um, of what's the word? Which, yes, that. <laughs> what's the word? What would she say? Departure. 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 Mm -hmm. Next question. <laughs> Trying to get that side facing. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aris. I'm a senior here. Um, I guess my question is because in May I'm going into the world. I'm gonna have to pay real taxes soon. Um, but my <laughs> real question is because I'm interested in politics and I have been for a long time. But more, I guess my question is, how do you find your center if you're in a space? Um, and this was something that I experienced when I got to Georgetown because I grew up in like 20 minutes south of Atlanta, so everybody looked like me, and that was mm -hmm. fine. And then I got here, and I found that it was a bit harder to be in rooms where I was the only person who looks like me, or for example, as you guys were talking about earlier, where people would see me and my experience had to speak for everyone who looks like me, even though I'm just one person. Mm -hmm. So going into, I particularly wanna go into the foreign service, so going into a field where there's a little bit of diversity, but not a lot of people who look like me, and then having to be sent to different countries where I'm representing the US, but also I'm gonna be representing black people. How do you guys find your center and like bring yourself back to your center when you're in a space where you have to where you have to serve as a representation for people who don't understand people that look like you? It is the age old question. You know, when I, when I use the word center, and Leah can speak to this certainly more prophetically than I, because she had a really big figure asked her that very question who was making very big decisions in his life. But for me, that is always my spiritual anchor. I can always tell when I'm off, when I, when I feel like I haven't you know, step back and meditated a little bit. Or when I feel like, you know, okay, I'm going into this room and I don't know how I'm going, you know, who's gonna like me? I don't care, well, I care, I don't, but I'm not, I don't wanna be frivolous about that. You go into these rooms, so you just, so I'm always mindful that I have to keep myself anchored in a spiritual place that just keeps me grounded. And that is really what has sincerely helped me and you know, I, I go off the beaten path just like anybody else, but I know when I am off, I have to step back and really start thinking about, okay, what's important? And I think your value system, you know, and this is where you have to, you know, this is where you will give your mother and your father, perhaps, some credit because you're gonna step in a room and all of a sudden something's gonna churn in your head that they have said to you. Mm -hmm. When you go into a room, nobody is, it more important than you. When you go into a room, we have given you this great education, so feel confident when you go into this room. When you go into this room, even if you make a mistake, be capable of owning that mistake, but also not retreating from it and all of a sudden, you know, you disappear. So I think you just have to keep saying to yourself, I can do this, I can do this. I am, you know, people used to, have you heard Muhammad Ali say, I am the greatest? Do you know where he got that from? himself. <laughs> Seriously, that's how, that's how it came about. He would look in the mirror and say, I am the greatest. And sometimes you have to do that just to psych yourself out. I need to do that too. I'm the greatest. <laughs> uh, one thing I would, um, there's a young man sitting right back oh. there. Stand up, Alan. Oh, look at please. Alan was ready to wave that hand. Alan, stand up, please. <laughs> This is Alan oh, Brooks for sure. Yes. yes, Alan Brooks for oh sure used God. to work for me for several years, and he is now in the Foreign Service. So you two connect before you leave. <laughs> and he's smart, determined. Very smart. Yep. 
Um, there's time for one more question, but before we go to that last question, um, to the point Mignon was making, and this is something that Mignon says in the book, the challenge for people of color when we take these unprecedented positions is that there's an expectation that we should carry the ball for everyone. You have to figure out how you are going to involve all people of color, all women, all disenfranchised groups. You become that voice and representative whether you want to be or not. Every time you go in a room, you have to ask yourself who isn't at the table. It is a basic set of principles that you learn in the movement. You must see other people even if they aren't in the room. So, last question. Right here. Oh. Oh, was it up front? Um, well, let's squeeze in two. Yeah. You, and then you will definitely be the last question. Hi, um, my name is Omiele. I'm a junior here in the college. And I had a question in the similar vein of like, um, you wanted to dismantle this notion of black women as like a monolithic group. Cause I have the a question in terms of like African Americans being seen as a monolithic group in politics. Um, I guess my, my question is, when I think about like the Obama presidency and administration, one thing that always stood out to me was him saying like, I'm not the president for black America, I'm the president for all of America, which I understood because like he's the president of the United States. But I think that one thing that like myself and other African Americans kind of struggle with is this idea of like um, the black vote kind of being taken advantage of in the Democratic Party because of the political homogeny of the like African American vote. We I think we vote like 90%. So I kind of wanted to know like, what is your advice for African Americans as a group to make sure that like, our vote is not being taken for granted, that we're being actually listened to and that our wants and needs are being met to various degrees? Great question. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with, um, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand, never has and never will. I, I, you know, for me, for African American voters, we are the most loyal and most consistent voting bloc in the nation. We, we vote, there's no question about that. When it comes to taking votes for granted, what we have to ask ourselves is what are we demanding from the system? Mm -hmm. So we vote and then what do we do? Mm -hmm. Mignon often mm -hmm. says that voting is not an event, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's about making your voice known. That's what voting is, it's making your voice and your choice known. So how do we continue to do that between elections? Far too often we elect people and then we have no contact with them. Mm -hmm. We don't ask them for anything. We don't check on them. We don't show up. And the next, t next time we want to talk about them is when it's election day again. Mm -hmm. Now, as you move into the workforce, what you will find is there is no job you will ever get <laughs> that you will be hired and the boss never comes back right. to see how you're doing mm -hmm. or to check on your work product mm -hmm. or to give you a performance review. But that's what we do as voters. Mm -hmm. We elect people, we're the boss, and we never go back mm. to say, this is what I want you to do. This is what I expect you to deliver. These are the results that I want, and I'll be back next month mm. to ask you <laughs> about that. Results? I always say, if your elected official doesn't know your name, you haven't done your job. Mm -hmm. yep. Make yourself a nuisance. Mm. Show up at their office, hello, I voted for you. And these are the issues that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And if you, you're either going to deliver on them or I'm going to find another candidate the next time. Mm -hmm. So when we don't, when we fail to make the demand, mm -hmm. then, I, then what we can expect is lowered mm -hmm. because we haven't asked for anything. Mm -hmm. When you go into the workforce, if you never ask for a raise, trust me, you'll never get one. That's right. <laughs> because as you're not asking, so your boss will say, oh, they fine. Yeah, right. I mean, me and Mo were at the DNC, we know how the raise thing works, right? People who, the squeaky wheel, the one that's gonna get on your nerves as managers, you say, okay, I gotta do, deal with the rate. Beyond being fair, but the people who say, here's my case for why I need what I need and why I'm requesting what I'm requesting are the ones who get the attention paid. And whether you're looking for money for programs, whether you're looking for a salary increase, whatever it is, you gotta make the demand. As voters, we have to practice the same principle. You elected someone, make the demand, hold them to an expectation and insist that they deliver it. And if they can't deliver, vote them out and get somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, I would also say, especially for African-American voters, because we tend to be a little bit more emotional know about how we vote and I think that's why you got that question we got that question because I do think there's a sense of 
okay, we had eight years and it really felt good, but you know, we got to look at the accomplishments. And so I do think we have to get some of the emotions out. And I try to tell people, make that switch in your head. Don't look at yourself like a constituency. Don't, look at, don't even look at yourself like a block. Look at yourself every day like you're a voter. And you should be expecting something, like Leah said, from your mm -hmm. candidates that you work for and that you elect. Because as long as you believe that you're a constituency, they're going to think you want something. Yep. You're owed something for sure. But you really do. And, you know, and I don't know why we tend to do this just, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we got them elected. And then we go home and... And don't be afraid to confront them. Yeah. You know, you they work for you. To hold, they have yeah. to be held accountable. Yeah. Just so like you, anybody else. And, you know, we, we're going to be in an interesting time this, this next cycle. We're going to have more women. We're going to have several people of color. We're going to have, we, we have our first gay person that jumped in today. We have a limited amount of white men that might be joining us. We don't know. They feel like mm -hmm. they're being squeezed out. We've heard it, <laughs> you know. But, but the point is there's going to be so many people out here and you know, you, you, some of you might pick your horse, get on it and ride it, but don't get on it and ride it just for the sake of getting on it and riding it. You have to have an agenda. Mm -hmm. If it's not for yourself, then have it for whoever you think your constituent, your constituency is. It's because you are riding them for a block of votes. And the last question here. Raise your hand so she can get it. No, Hello. Mic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm a little sick. Well, good evening. My name is Daniela Sanchez, and it's such an honor to be able to speak with you all tonight. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, my question kind of pertains to um, all people of color and like, um, be, like being in college and like being here at Georgetown, I feel like the majority kind of discredit us people of color and they kind of in a way think that we're only here because we're people of color and so we're not at their level. So I feel like this also relates to the workplace. So how, what is your advice to combat this kind of mentality where we're only there because we're people of color and we're not at par or at the level that um, other people see themselves at? What's your you. uh, grade point average? Um, here at Georgetown, mm -hmm. I have a 3.5. Oh, bless God. God, I wish yeah. I had that at Carleton. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> as a person of color, you are quite smart. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and understand that. Listen, I went to Dartmouth, and you know, and I was a woman at Dartmouth. I was a black woman at Dartmouth. Dartmouth didn't let women in until 1977. So, okay, so we late to the game on just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, been trying to catch up ever since. You know, I had the experience of being uh, on a campus where I wasn't wanted because I was a woman and then add black to it and it was just a whole other thing. And you know, white boys stopped me on the corner to ask me, did I know where the financial aid office was? Or the dorm mates asking me to help me with their laundry, help them with my, their laundry. I'm like, what makes you think I know how to do laundry? <laughs> <laughs> but so I understand that experience. What you have to do, and I think what part of what I, at least what my parents told me, is mm -hmm. you're going to have to work harder. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be better, and then they're still not going to think mm -hmm. you as smart. So here's what I do. I, work, I will outwork anybody. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know my stuff. I know I have to know more. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a reason I was CEO twice. I know how to do that job, mm -hmm. right? So, and I'm clear mm -hmm. about my ability and about what I am bringing to the table. Yep. And as long as I walk in the room with confidence mm -hmm. and, 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 and assurance in my own capacity to work hard, to get a job done, and not just to get it done, but to get it done with excellence, then there are always going to be the vestiges of white dumb. White dumb. White dumb, <laughs> who, who think you're less, and that's just their own self-protection mm -hmm. mechanism mm -hmm. because they're dealing now with a different America. Oh, and they're privileged. And they're privileged, and that's, you know, it's just, it's part of what comes with the territory. So you gotta, you gotta build, I, I often say, confidence is a decision, yeah. mm -hmm. decide. Mm -hmm. Right. Decide that you're going to be better. Decide that you're going to be confident. Decide that you're going to be bold. No, that's the decision is only on you. No one else can make you confident. No one else can make you self-assured. No one else can make you bold in the moment. That's those. Those are things you have to decide to do. So decide and walk in the room. You know your stuff because we over prepare. You know your stuff. Go in there and do what you know how to do. And if you and if you and okay. if you want to be, if there's something like an organization that you want to be in that, that they don't really want you to be, go start your own damn organization. Yeah. 
But you know, also, I, I, I hear the anxiety of, you know, it's so funny because we've had so many of these forums, and I hear the anxiety of young people, especially those that are just about getting ready to come out. You really do have some time, you know. You ain't got to learn it all tomorrow. Yeah, give yourself yeah. some time to really think through who you want to be yeah. once you graduate and as you're coming through school. You really don't have to figure all of this out tonight yeah. or tomorrow because the very fact that you ask the question tells me you know the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. You know the question. You know, you know, girls, when the boys, when somebody say, is my boyfriend cheating on me? When you ask that question, you know he cheating on you. Same thing, same premise. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you this last story. When I was uh, doing, uh, I did the Harvard IOP. I was a fellow at the Harvard IOP, and I, we had to have office hours. And so I'm in my office, and one of the students comes in. He's a freshman, and he sits and he closes the door. I, I need to talk to you, Reverend Daughtry. I need to talk. He's like, fine. Close the door. He says, my office is a vault when you know when the door is closed. And so he said, I. I, I I just don't know how to say this, but I feel like I can say it to you. And I said, okay, just, just say it. I thought he was gonna come out. I thought it was, you know, I get, I got, I got all, I'm the reverend, so I got all of the people with uh, things they want to discuss that, uh, that were life-changing matters. I said, so just say it. He said, I made a decision. I said, okay, what's the decision? I want to be president of the United States. <laughs> What should I do? <laughs> and I he like, made the decision, though. <laughs> I said, finish freshman year. <laughs> right. I like, do the thing that's in front of you. Don't fret about the things down the road. Was Enjoy he even old enough? No, he, was no. a, he was a freshman, though, oh, child. Oh, oh, baby, and it was freshman fall. Honey, <laughs> <laughs> you just got it. I Calm swear. Calm down, enjoy the experience. Enjoy Let your life. Let life unfold. Yeah. Prepare yourself. Soak up what you can soak up. Yep. Take the opportunities when they come, and don't stress about it. Child, I didn't know what I would want to do till I was 40 years old, and if you ask me some days now, I still don't know. And I want a whole right. new exactly. career. So it never changes, babe. Nope, never changes. <laughs> and I, I want to close this out by reading from the book, and these are words from, from Leah Daughtry. And it's to, and it speaks to the question, the last question, your, your question that you just asked. Um, you, you, you write, Leah, we took that, so talking about the, the campaign, the Jackson mm -hmm. campaign, we took that same ethos that every black child in America has and has and walked through the door with that ethos. We always say you can't outwork us. Mm -hmm. One thing about it, you're not going to outwork a colored girl. Mm -hmm. What we don't know, we're going to make up for it in hard work. The Jackson campaign, we didn't know a thing about running a presidential campaign, but we knew how to work hard. Just being black in America means you have to be versatile mm -hmm. and you have to have a dexterity of language and a dexterity of movement and be able to shift. Mm -hmm. Read the tea leaves of what's ahead, but also deal with what's in the cup right now. That's just how you are when you're black in America, because we deal with multiple cultures and we are bi and tri and quadrilingual in this nation. Mm -hmm. And while that is specific to African Americans, that is specific to anyone who feels outside of mm -hmm. what's called majority culture. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be dexter. You have to be. You have to have dexterity. You have to be mm. quadrilingual. Mm. Um, I think in one conversation, Leah, you said, "What are all the languages you speak?" I speak uh, uh, proper American English. I speak. <laughs> I speak Brooklyn. <laughs> I speak black people. I speak old people. I speak church people. <laughs> I speak politics. I can speak depending on where I am in the, in the world. It's a different way of talking and being and 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 acting. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's it's different. Y'all heard the word code different switch. Yeah. <laughs> it's different when I'm home switch. in Brooklyn. You know the accents different. You know G's. It comes off. out sometimes too. You know. <laughs> they know when I've been home because I you know oh, yeah. if I've been home three or four days then I sound like Brooklyn. Yeah, she does. They're like, oh, you've been home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's get, um, I've given my final thoughts by reading your thoughts, mm -hmm. but um, let me get um, um, Yolanda and Mignon to give their final thoughts. We've got a presidential election coming up. We just went through a night nightmare two years ago. Mm -hmm. 
I want to make sure that every single person in this room is going to get involved. We've got, uh, last time people said we didn't have any choices. We ain't, all we had was Hillary and Bernie. This time, you got choices up the wazoo. <laughs> You're gonna have choices that you don't need. But pick a candidate. I'm asking you, pick a candidate and work for that candidate and work your asses off for that candidate because we gotta take this thing back. We have got to take our country back. I like this little thing going on out here. Yeah, that's, they brought that back. That's, is that a clap back? They, they brought that back. <laughs> is that a Cardi B cap back? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to add, Yolanda, once they pick their, because th they will have choices up the wazoo, but if, <laughs> but if their candidate isn't the nominee, what do they do? If your candidate isn't the nominee, then you support the nominee. Right, that's normal. This is what we do in the Democratic Party. We all work for different people in the primaries, but when, when the general election comes, you support the nominee. Mm -hmm. And you work just as hard as hard for them as you did for the other. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that point was there. Mm -hmm. Mignon, your final thoughts. So I'm going to I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. Oh boy. The future is really in your hands, not mm -hmm. ours. Cuz the truth is, you have more power than we do because your vote the sheer amount of voting power that millennials have, that young people have now, is just unprecedented. They're the largest voting bloc, right? Largest voting bloc. And so don't let anyone tell you that you are not. So you really do control the future of America, and you control my future. So if anybody's sitting in here saying that it doesn't matter, please say it when I leave. Don't, don't say it while I'm in the room, because it does matter. And I want you all to take the charge. I want to look up on Instagram or on Snapchat or whatever y'all using and say, God, them are some of the kids I saw over at Georgetown and they are really taking this serious and they are leading this voting charge because you are the difference between getting a good candidate and what we have right now. You are absolutely the difference. And you don't talk about confidence. Let me tell you something, working on a campaign is the best way to build confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go in there, if you start as a volunteer, you make yourself indispensable. Yeah. You know, you get the coffee, you do the mimeograph machine. <laughs> you do, you do whatever you have to you do. You send out all the emails. And you send, That's yeah, you really but, you, but, but get noticed. Right. But get noticed. But make yourself indispensable, and I guarantee you in six months they'll hire you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's how you move up as well. Mm -hmm. the, the, the last thing I'd say is... Um, the most revolutionary, controversial, woke thing you can do mm -hmm. is to build relationships. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're living in a time where relationships mm -hmm. are not important. You never have to leave your house. Yep. You, can, you can order everything online. You never have to talk to anybody. It can all be email. But the thing that will separate you, yeah. that will move you out of the pack, that will help our country to be better, Mm -hmm. is to build relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. Actual, talking, face-to-face -face relationships. Yep. Mm -hmm. They will save you when you don't know what to do. They will pull you out of the fire when you mm. are in the fire. And they will help you to grow your careers and to be better people. It's a countercultural notion right now. Yeah. But I want you to think of that as a revolutionary thing mm. to help move our country forward, is to see each other mm -hmm. and to be in relationship with other people. Instead of sending those fake, fake texts, how you doing? I'm like, my nephew. Oh, let's have do lunch. If, don't say let's have lunch if you're not going to have lunch. Have lunch. <laughs> my nephew do that all I the call time. you. Don't say that if you're not going to do it. I want to challenge you to actually call, yep. to actually go to lunch, to actually sit with someone and look them in the eyes and have a conversation mm -hmm. that helps to grow the humanity and recognize the humanity that we have in each other and the divinity, from my perspective, the divinity that is in each one of us. And but stop and see it. And with that, we're going to leave it there. Leah Daughtry, Yolanda Caraway, Mignon Moore, and the departed Donna Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you.